Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. So great to be here. We are in a series called The Life and Times of Jesus Christ, going through the book of John. Have you enjoyed going through the book of John? I have been loving it, and today I get to take another piece of chapter 10, and I'm kind of looking for, where's Caleb? Right over here? There. Yeah. Sorry that I'm wearing the same thing you saw last week. <laughs> you were at Resonate Church last week and I was preaching there. But it's not the same message, okay? Totally different. So I'm looking at John chapter 10, and you've got to stay with me on this one, because uh, the book of John is an amazing book. It's not just a, a history book. It doesn't just give you a bunch of things that happened. It gives you a bunch of why this happened. And for us to actually track through the book of John, we've got to have an open heart because you're not going to get it in your head. Matter of fact, Jesus continually kicks against that you can only figure things out and only go by what you understand. He He keeps going against that. Why? Because you'll never figure God out in your head. And, and if you have to figure him out in your head before you follow him, you'll never follow. But you can figure things out in your head, but it's the other way around. It starts with you believe. It yeah. starts with your heart, and then your head follows. So before I say any more, um, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I was through John chapter 9, taught about the... Uh, person that was born blind and Jesus healed, of course, on the Sabbath day. And of course, he did it in a weird way. He did not fit the normal. He spat and he made some mud, put it in the guy's eye and said, go and wash, and a miracle happened. And everybody was upset with when he did it or how he did it instead of why he did it. Because God loves us and he's got a plan for our lives. And he keeps on trying to break, help us break free of this stronghold we have. And if you remember what a stronghold is, a stronghold is where we build barriers to protect what's inside. Like a castle with walls or a city with walls. We build barriers to protect what's inside those barriers to, to, to keep it um, under our control. And to keep it from what's outside the barriers, which is not under our control. And all of us have strongholds in our head where we build these these barriers of this is how I understand it. This is how I, I, I can figure it out. And as long as it fits within my understanding, I feel I've got control. And you know, if everything in your life has to fit within your understanding... What that's called is secular humanism. Why? Because you become the God of your world. And we got to recognize there is a God, and we never have to worry about fitting in his barriers or in, in his understanding because it is infinite. And Jesus continually tried to help the disciples and everyone else recognize life is bigger than what you can see feel, taste, touch, hear. It's bigger than our carnal world, our fleshly world. And as we just think about that, it kind of sets us up for for what he's talking about here. In John chapter 10, verse 22. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. Now, this is probably three months after the beginning of the chapter where he was... Um, in the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, it was kind of like the bringing in of the harvest and everything. So this is like Christmas time, you know, December time. And it's recognized it's three months before, probably, his crucifixion. So this is in the last three years that Jesus is with his disciples on this planet. And I call it the last year of their three-year master's program in Follow Me. (laughs) So he's been teaching them all along, and he continues to kind of hammer home what's most important, which is 
It's bigger than you think. God is bigger than you think. He's got it under control. You, if, if you're trying to fit it in your box, it's not going to fit. There's going to be things that happen, like COVID. It comes along and everybody goes, ah, it doesn't fit my box. And you know what? When things come along that don't fit under your control, what it produces in your life is called anxiety. And we have never had an attack of anxiety like these last years. It is the one word that kind of um, describes our culture today. But you see, the way to get rid of anxiety is to take it away from your control. It's his control. And if it's under God's control, then you're fine. So he starts off by, this is three months later. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounding him, the, the people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. In other words, would you please say it such that I can control it, so that I can understand it, so it fits in my little box. It is never going to fit in your little box. You're never going to understand God up here. He's bigger than up here. So it goes back to that, the battle between carnal thinking up here and spiritual thinking, which is recognizing that this, for instance, this room is full of angels. Did you recognize that? It's amazing how we can go through life and never recognize what really is happening. Do you recognize that when we say God is love, that's not a feeling? God is love. You, you, love doesn't fit in your five physical senses. It goes beyond. When we say the word of God is all powerful, we have no idea the extent of that. Right. Yeah, good. Okay. We have to continually recognize this life is bigger than we think it is. We can do more than we think we can. Here, Jesus is actually having to answer the question again. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this, this carnal way of thinking. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, For we walk according to the flesh, but we don't fight according to the flesh. What do you mean fight? Well, when things happen, can I use COVID again? When things happen that don't understand, we don't battle according to our, the way we think. For the, the weapons, he says, of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's these little barriers. This is how we figure it out. Casting down every high thing, every reasoning, every argument, taking every thought into captivity that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, recognizing that our thinking holds us in this place where we're going to be victims of, of a, a world that doesn't fit. And things are going to happen that don't fit. But Jesus came that we could have life and that more abundantly. And in him, there is freedom. And there is peace. In him, in the way that, that we understand the world is through the word of God. Oh, there's so much I could go on and on, but I'm just going to ask you, if you haven't listened to the message I preached on John chapter 9, go back and listen to it because it makes a difference. But Jesus, he says, why don't you just tell us plainly? And one of the reasons is Jesus answers this question when the disciples ask him, why are you always speaking in parables? Why can't you just plainly tell us the way it is? And he answers in Matthew chapter 13, his disciples came to him and asked him, why do you always use these hard to understand illustrations, parables? Then he explained to them that only they who were permitted to understand about the kingdom of heaven and others were not. So they that were hearing the parables and somehow they made sense were permitted, but those that didn't understand, those that it didn't make sense to, there was a reason. He used parables so that they wouldn't 
understand. Matthew 13, verse 13 says, that is why I use these illustrations, so people will hear and see, but do not understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah. They hear, but don't understand. They look, but they don't see. So important. And this is all in this chapter called the Good Shepherd. It's an allegory. Jesus is a shepherd, but that only means that you're a sheep. Look around. Do you see any sheep? We're people. But it's an allegory that uses the example. And Jesus keeps coming back to this, and here it comes. Verse 25, Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is in the work that I do, but you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. There's the key. When you're his sheep, you hear his voice. Hearing the voice of Jesus is not a head thing. It's a heart thing. Hearing the voice of the good shepherd, the master, is leaning into who we already believe he is. And so the things he says actually begin to make sense. If we're trying to figure it out up here, we'll, we'll never hear his voice. One of the things I loved about what he said was, you're not my sheep because my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Do you know that God knows you? Back at the beginning of the chapter, in John chapter 10, verse 3, he says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, recognize his voice, and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name. He calls us by name. I don't know about you, but that kind of blows me away. He knows my name. Years ago, we were at a... Uh, a um, a celebration of Mercy Ministries International, their 30 years, and Israel Houghton uh, ministered at it. And he did this song called, uh, I'm Not Forgotten. He Knows My Name. He tells this story. And the story is his, his mother, this teenage girl, got pregnant, was so outcast by everybody and everything, and she's like eight months pregnant, walking down the street, and this lady across the street sees her, runs across the street, and says to her, I just needed to tell you that God loves you. And she breaks down, because she'd never heard anything like this before, and right there on the street has this altar call, and she gets saved. And because she gets saved, she takes this baby, which she was going to give away, keeps this baby, raises this baby. And like Israel says, did that lady who crossed the street know that what she was doing may affect millions of people? The bottom line was God knows your name even before you're born. He knows you. He knows everything about you. Why? Because he's the good shepherd. And we're his sheep. Have you ever um, have you ever recognized how you hear your name? You you hear your name above every other word. If someone if, if there was a crowd of people and we were all talking at the same time and somebody said your name, you'd hear them. Do you ever recognize how um, if you're a parent? You can hear your kid's voice in a crowd. There could be all kids screaming, but you know which one's yours. How did you do that anyway? <laughs> well, can I give you a little brain science? There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, <laughs> which is miraculous in every way. And we say this about it often in the you know, medical world. It tunes things out. But actually, it doesn't tune things out as much as it tunes things in. The reticular activating system in your brain allows you to tune in 
to certain words or certain voices. But the interesting thing about it, it's not something that is a, a, a brain intended. Your brain didn't build this in. Your heart built it into your brain. You will lean into, you will actually hear the words that you value, the voices that you value the most. And so when your child, which your heart is loves, he, he makes that noise, you know it's your child. And there's a part of your brain that is, is a, amazing. And so your brain, period, is amazing. Do you know that? Amazing. But this reticular activating system, it allows us to tune in to who we value, to who we lean in. Allows us to tune in to who we value, to who we lean in to. You're not my sheep because you don't hear my voice. Because you've never leaned into him. I remember years ago trying to help kids in our youth group. that They just couldn't figure it out. I just can't, I just can't handle it. I, I just don't understand how God can be this and God can be that and God can be... And, and they're trying to make it in their head and I would continually... And I didn't know these things back then, but I just knew that I knew. This is how you do it. Stop! Stop trying to figure it out in your head. Just answer this. If you just forget what you're thinking up here and, and, and recognize down here... Do you believe that you're created and on purpose and there's someone that loves you? Do you believe that there's a God that loves you? And so often tears start flowing down the, their, their head. You, you can't understand it, but you can believe it. And the thing about faith, it's not up here. It's down here. And if you start down here, things follow up here. Um, a good friend of ours, she's a, a scientist, neurophysiologist, Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's actually been here to our church. Um, she makes this statement, which I think is so true. Science is to admire God. But that only starts when you know God. Everything else follows it, it admires. Science doesn't prove God. You can't. There's not enough science in the world to prove how big God is because God is bigger. So science doesn't prove and therefore it doesn't disprove. But science itself will admire God. But it starts with, first of all, here. You, you're not my sheep because you don't hear my voice. And I know my sheep. He knows you by name. Listen, he knows you by name. I, that just blows me away. Think of everything he's ever done for me. And uh, it starts with, <laughs> I, I've heard him say this many times. He calls me Johnny, by the way. <laughs> but when he does, he gets my attention. And when he does, there's something that happens down here. And when he does, I lean in and I can hear. I can hear his voice. I can hear what he's saying to me. I know what he's saying to you. There's many of you in the room right now, you don't know how much he adores you. He loves you. He's done for you. If you lean in, you'll hear. And when you lean in, you know what you hear? You'll hear your voice. The voice of him saying your name to me. You'll hear your name. That's how much God loves you. John chapter 20. I love this. Have you ever wondered this? Jesus has died on the cross, rose again. And some of the women came to the tomb to meet him. Verse 15 says, Dear, and... and as they see him, they, they, they don't recognize him. And they say, dear woman, or this is what Jesus said, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, 
If you have taken him away, that's the, the body of Jesus, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is the Hebrew teacher. She didn't recognize him from looking. She didn't recognize him because he's saying all the right other things. She recognized him when she heard her name. He loves you, and he knows your name. I, I love that. He knows your name, and he calls your name. Verse 28, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Philippians 1, 6. He will finish what he started. You know, why don't you put your faith in him, not you? Instead of thinking, I can't do it. You're probably right. But he can't. Put your faith in the one that said, I'll finish what I started. Why? Because no one can snatch you out of his hand. If you just listen, you'll hear your name. And he'll, if, if the good shepherd's calling your name, he's got you. He's got you. You're okay. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. This is the actual sixth attempt to kill him. Why? <laughs> because he said the Father and I are one. But the sixth attempt, I love these attempts. You should go back and just read them. They're all funny. They're, they're quite comical. The first one, you know th when, when the first one happened? After Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan by his cousin John, he come up out of the water, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, 40 days of fasting, 40 days of warfare. He comes out of the wilderness, goes into the temple, grabs the, 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 the scroll of the day, which was Isaiah 61, and he, he says, today, this scripture is, is made fulfilled in your eyes in, in your eyes and ears where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Da, 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 da. And again, they thought this is blasphemy. He's calling himself Jesus. He's calling himself the, the son of God. So they pushed him. Listen to this. Um, Luke 4, 28. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious, jumping up. They mobbed him and forced him to the edge of a hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I just can think it's, it's got to be kind of funny how there's a crowd of people pushing him towards the cliff, and all of a sudden, where'd he go? <laughs> he, he just walked right through the middle of them all. But it was like when, when Jesus was being on the day before he was crucified and all of the you know, soldiers came and Peter whips out his sword to take off the ear and Jesus said, put your sword away. Don't you know I could, I could call 12 legions of angels right now? Like there's no lack of opportunity and ways for Jesus to escape. But his time wasn't yet. So anyway, they tried again. And Jesus said, verse 32, in my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They, re they replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus replied, it is written in your own scriptures that God said to certain leaders of the people, I say to you, you are gods. And you know the scriptures cannot be altered. So if those people who received God's message were called gods, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the Son of God? After all, the Father set me apart and sent me into the world. Ah, that's a, a very confusing little bit of scripture there. But here's my overhaul of that. Jesus is saying, what does he get so messed up with semantics for? It's not what you say. When you say blasphemy, you don't even understand. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for a title or a name. He knew who he was. He's the son of God. 
he's the Messiah, he's coming to the world, he's the good shepherd, and they're trying to mess, you know, mix things up with names. So he says, if, if you have such a problem with names, just go to your own scriptures, which he said cannot fail. And back in Psalm 82, which actually this psalm is a rebuke. Before I read it, listen to it. It's a rebuke to the judges of that day. Those are people, mortal people, that have an anointing to be a judge. Okay, they were wicked in those days. And so he identifies these mere, mere mortals in the role of calling them a judge as they're called gods. So it's really not about people are gods. It's about semantics. Verse 8, um, Psalm 82, God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. How long will you hand down unjust decisions by favoring the wicked? Interlude. Give justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of the evil people. But these oppressors know nothing. They are so ignorant. They wander about in darkness while the whole world is shaken to the core. I say you are gods. You are all children of the Most High. But you will die, mere mortals. And so it is a rebuke. They are called gods, but the word doesn't mean anything. And so for, for them to be all upset about words, Jesus actually says, look at your own scriptures. Verse 37, don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. But if I do this work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I've done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that my Father's in me and I'm in the Father. I remember when our life got turned around and, and we're, we're asked to explain this so often to so many people that did not understand. Why? Because they did not believe. And they wanted us to uh, make this work for them. And after trying and failing over and over again, this was our final every time. We'd just walk away and say, listen, just watch us. Do you want to know? Just watch. Why? Because what we live out will say louder than any words we could explain who we are and what's going on. Just watch us. And that's what the world's doing. They're just watching. And Jesus is saying here to them, you don't believe me, you don't believe my words, so just watch me. Watch what I do. If I do what I say I'll do, then I'll, I, I should be what I say I am. So much of what we do comes down to actually our faith having works. Faith has works. Live faith has works. Dead faith has no works. And our works should verify what we believe. Jesus said to his disciples many times, he said things like, if you love me, you'll do. If you love me, you'll do. Okay? What you believe should be seen in what you do. It's not about having a, this understanding. It's having this follow me. That's what the disciples are all about. Follow me. Ah, and Jesus resurrected, ascends into heaven. Book of Acts. What did they do? Not what they can understand. They do what he did. They follow him. That's the thing for all of us. We need to recognize we will never figure this thing out. But we can follow. We can trust. We can believe. And when we lean in, we can hear his voice. And when we hear his voice, he's the good shepherd. As we've said throughout this chapter, he will lay his life down. Brandon, a couple of weeks ago, Talked about what a good shepherd is. It's one that actually will lay his life down for us. Actions speak louder than words. Do you know that our actions in every way speak louder? To who? Well, to God. But big time to us. A lot of us say a lot of stuff but never do a lot of stuff. And you know the one that knows it more than anyone else is you and I. But when I do what I say, there's a confidence that comes with it. Yeah. 
And like I said, this, this world, you're going to get all kinds of things that you don't understand. COVID, don't understand. Do you know what's happening right now? Gas prices. <laughs> Have you not wondered what's going on? Is the world coming to an end? Two dollars? You know that right now we're, like never before, anxiety in our, in our world. And then anxiety has, has gone from um, a physical um, sickness to now a financial where there's many people that are so anxious about, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I'll be able to continue. I, it's t <clears throat> Do you know what will make the difference? Who's your good shepherd? Who are you leaning into? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that a carnal mind leans to death, but a spiritual mind, one whose mind is set on the things of the spirit, leads to life and peace. Jesus said, watch me. According to what you see is what I believe. And there's a lot of people in my world, I've, I've wanted to say to them, you know, the Dr. Phil thing, how's that working for you? Because instead of believing what the Bible says, they just could continue doing what they think. How's that working for you? Do you know when it comes to finances, the way we think is opposite to the way he thinks? Right. Really. And I, I know some really great people I love with all my heart that are in financial crisis and I can tell them why. Because they know the truth but they're not, they're not actually living it. How's that working for you? Yeah. You know, the Bible tells us that to put God first, to treat him, give him lordship, if you will, yeah. of our finances, means to bring the first and the best to God. That's what tithing is. If you've never tithed, listen to what it is. It's simply bringing the first tenth of your increase, the first, not the second, third, fourth, the first, to God, trusting him with the rest. And he says, when you bring me that first, test me if I'll not open the windows of heaven. That's your, now your increase doesn't come from out there. It comes from here. He'll use those, but it'll come from God. And he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. So the one that's come to steal, he'll actually do the warfare on your behalf for the one that comes to steal. So that actually... God looks after us. And I have seen it so many times. There's people in our world where, where it's never crossed their mind not to trust God and give him first. And they've never had a problem. Yeah. It's not like they're, they're super brilliant or super whatever. God just looks after them. Yeah. I love it. And it's not so much that God looks after them because they have more than enough money. They've got peace. Yeah. There's no anxiety. There's no stress. Like, oh, how am I going to pay the next bill? But I know other people that are so smart and so talented and got everything that you, you could think going from them, but they don't trust God first. Why? Because it doesn't make sense up here. Up here says, if I want to have more, I got to keep it to myself. But God says, no, trust him. Give him lordship of your finances and, and look, at, look at how life's going to go. So I just encourage you. You haven't gone there, you need to. Verse 39, once again, they tried to arrest him, but he got away from them. There we go, the seventh time. He went beyond the Jordan River near the place where John was first baptizing and stayed there a while, and many followed him. John did perform miracle signs, they remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true, and many who were there believed in him. Lean in. I want to just leave you with this. Lean in. Okay? You will hear what you value here. Lean in and put him first. Value his voice, and you'll hear it. So two things that I'd like to leave you with as a practice. Number one is...
Thank God for what he's saying to you. Okay? Don't wait till I, I you know, see you in the stars or something. No, lean in and then begin to thank him for what he's saying to you. Secondly, tell somebody. Wow. It goes to a whole other level when you tell someone else what God is saying to you. And don't say it like this. God said, and, and then no one has. No, say it like this. I think God is saying this to me. And when you do, then you open people up invitation to come into the conversation. So lean in. Thank him for what he's saying. And tell someone else. Let me pray for you. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. Recognize there's so much more to this life than what you can see, feel, to hear, touch. Right now, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is here. The Savior of the world. The Lamb that was slain who hung on that cross and looked across the years and said, I'm doing this because I love you. The one that calls you by name. He's made a way where there is no way. He's the El Shaddai, more than enough. And he's for you. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's all powerful. And he's all loving. And he's here. And I just invite you to put your hand in the hand. <laughs> Just lean into him right now. So, Father, I thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, welcome in this place. Thank you that we get to understand you, get to know you for all eternity. I pray if there's anyone here today that is not certain, not sure, question mark. Maybe they've tried to figure it out and it just has never worked. And today they recognize, no, it's not a matter of thinking right. It's just a matter of receiving. If you're here and you've never opened your heart to Jesus, there's a question mark. If you were to die today, step into eternity today, where would you go? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you just step out with Jesus into eternity with him or is there a question mark? If there is, I'm going to ask you to make cho a choice right now. Say yes to God. You don't have to leave this place questioning. You can know that you know heaven's your home. You're part of the family. So right now, all over the room, heads bowed, nobody looking around. If you say that's me, I want to leave certain sure that heaven's my home I'm part of the family of God include me in that prayer that's you wherever you're sitting slip your hand up could I pray for you thanks thank you thanks who else all over the room thank you yeah thanks thank you I love it when people take this opportunity and I love it when we give this opportunity I remember it changed my everything. Changed everything. There's hands going up. If you've not slipped yours up, maybe you're online and you need to slip your hand up, just go ahead. If you're all by yourself, nobody's watching anyway except God. Is there anyone else? All right, you can put your hands down. I'm going to invite everyone to pray this little prayer. I'll give you the words. Prayer is just talking to God. We're going to talk to him together. If you slipped your hand up or if you should have, Let's talk to him and say these words with all your heart. Everybody say this, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me. I believe you died on the cross to take my place because you know me and you love me. Right now, I give you my heart. From this day on, I want to serve you. Help me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap, church.
God bless you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.